Hi, friends. So I'm recording this on the 27th of February, 2022. Uh, it has not been a good week for humanity in general. Um, there's been the news out of Ukraine and some really awful transphobic and homophobic laws out of the States. Um, and uh, I don't have anything that I could possibly add to the discussion of um, Ukraine and Russia. My heart just goes out to, to all Ukrainian people, um, uh, those there and, and those watching their country from abroad. I know a little of what it's like to, to watch uh, things happen in, in the region of the world you're from. and. Um, uh not to be able to do anything um it's hard so my heart goes out to you when it comes to these anti-trans and anti-gay um legislations happening in some of the, the southern united states i do actually have um a bit of queer theory that i think could be useful to you in in thinking about these these discourses. So there is this concept from queer theory called reproductive futurism. And it was coined by Lee Edelman in his 2004 book, No Future, Queer Theory and the Death Drive. So this idea, reproductive futurism, is the idea that politics does and should revolve around the figure of the child and the sort of future of the human species. And Edelman talks about how the way that heteronormative society imagines queerness um, as not being reproductive, which, yeah, um, is, makes, means that it treats uh, queerness as an inherent threat to the child. The thing here is we're talking not about children, we're talking about the child. Those capitals are important. So how does this come in to these discussions? So what is happening in Texas is the state's attorney general has issued an opinion that parents seeking trans-affirming care for their children is child abuse. Uh, and the governor is trying to make that happen. Um, if you want to know more about this, um, I would direct you to, um, if you want to know more about this, I will direct you to uh, a video by Jesse Gender um, in the, the, the doobly-doo. And if you want to know about what we mean by trans-affirming healthcare, uh, there's a video by Mia Mulder that I will also link. Uh, you should really be listening to trans people on um, trans issues. Um, but if you need sort of a TLDR from a cis person, if that will, um, is we're talking about these therapies. We're not talking about anything that is irreversible. We're talking about puberty blockers and counseling. Um, it's basically like the things that are irreversible do not happen until until the young person is of age to make those decisions. Um, puberty blockers just delay, give them time um, to you know grow into it and without the pressure and the fear of natal puberty, which is irreversible. So um, yes, again, you should listen to trans people about trans issues. I'm talking about this concept of the child and reproductive futurism because really this is cis nonsense that's being used against trans people. So here's me. <laughs> I mean, we, we need as cis people to be aware when you hear this nonsense being used to harm others, where it's coming from and what it means. And it's not just trans kids who are issue here. Um, there's also the bills in Florida, which are trying, which described as don't say gay. They're trying to um, stop teachers from talking about uh, LGBTQ issues 
from queerness at all. Um, and also want to compel teachers to tell parents if a kid comes out to them. So regardless of the kid's consent or if it's safe for them to do so. So if we think about these laws from the perspective of trans kids in Texas or queer kids in Florida, uh, this is clearly going to harm children, harm minors. You know, if we imagine like young John, if we imagine like a young boy who is finding himself attracted to boys and his sex ed doesn't teach him how to do, to have male to male sex safely, he may not learn or he may learn too late. Um, we can imagine a young girl who is who doesn't learn that you know people can be attracted to more than one gender, and thinks that there is something wrong with her. We can imagine a kid who knows that they aren't the gender that they were assumed to be, and the world right now is harsh and cruel for a lot of those kids. But hey, this kid's mom is on their side so at least they have someone and the state then comes and says that that's abuse so clearly real children would come to harm from these laws so why am i talking about reproductive futurism and the idea of protecting the child because those children aren't a part of the child the child isn't really real children what these conservative pundits and other folks using thinking in this ideology are thinking about they're imagining it's sort of the platonic ideal of childhood this unspoiled innocent being that embodies the future so it's the child as a representative sort of of the future of the future of the species and more often than not when while they aren't saying it it's the future of the race because it's very rarely all children who get to be the child right it's a very specific image of which children are the child because this also plays into the laws where the conservatives are banning what they think critical race theory is. It's not what critical race theory actually is, but they want to protect children from learning anything that might them make them feel ashamed of their uh, race. Uh, so they they can't they don't want to teach children about the reality of the civil rights movement or the reality of slavery in case it spoils their innocence and their imagined view of history but they're not interested but they're not thinking about how to protect black children or brown children from the actual effects of racism their concern is protecting white children from feeling bad about whiteness and the thing about the child versus children is children grow up, right? <laughs> children are younger, or smaller humans becoming on a journey to adulthood, right? They will at some point learn about the civil rights movement and about slavery. There is no way you can prevent these people from at some point learning the history of their country. A bit of a story. I remember very clearly when I was 21 um, and taking a Canadian poli sci class. Um, and the professor taught us about the destruction of Africaville in Nova Scotia. And he talked about the Indian Act and some of the laws and structures in which Canada had used to oppress Indigenous people. And this was a room full of young people who were white or more like model minority, which I kind of still was at the time. And he got us talking about some of the things that we had witnessed. This was Saskatoon 
in the early 2000s. And if, if you don't know Canada, Saskatoon is, Saskatchewan is one of the worst places for um, racism, structural racism. Uh, it's particularly at the time it, it was socially segregated um, in a lot of ways. Uh, and many bad things happened. Um, and so, of course, we had all witnessed things. Um, but, you know, this was the first time we'd really talked about it. And none of us had the context to understand it because nobody had given us that part of the history. And I remember as we sat there together and he guided us through this, there was this profound grief in the room because we were reckoning with the fact that the Canada that we had been taught about was a lie. We were reckoning with the fact that we had not been given the information to contextualize what our country was. It came all at once instead of bit by bit. And by that point, we were adults. Um, so these kids who aren't taught about the history of their country and the wrongs that it did, at some point they will confront it. And they might not have a teacher who can guide them through it. It might not be in a university class with a professor who knows how to do that. And best case scenario, they will educate themselves and probably cause harm to people in the meantime. Worst case scenario, they rebel against the information and become reactionaries. And the same is true about transness and queerness. Kids grow up and whether gender and sexuality is a thing that's discovered or developed or probably somewhere in between, it's a thing that is just a part of humanity. Some people are left-handed, some people are right-handed, some people are short, some people are tall. Some people are the gender that they were assumed at birth and some people are not. Some people are attracted to one gender, whether that be like themselves or the opposite. And some people are attracted to more than one and some are attracted to none. This, these are just facts of the human experience. And not telling kids about queerness <laughs> won't stop that from happening. It will just deny them the knowledge and the context to understand what is happening to themselves or their classmates. If people enacting these laws actually cared about the actual kids as humans, they might consider that that, that lack of knowledge is going to cause harm. But they're not thinking about the actual kids. They're thinking about the child. The child exists in a state of perpetual innocence and perfect possibility. Actual children without guidance often fear what they don't understand. Not always, but sometimes without guidance, that is what happens. That is what humans do. <laughs> sometimes humans are afraid of things we don't understand. And maybe I'm falling a little bit into reproductive futurism here, um, thinking about the harm that, uh, that could come to uh, queer and trans kids. But I think there's a difference between thinking about the ideal of childhood and thinking about actual young humans trying to negotiate the messy business of becoming an adult, because they will become adults. They will join our adult society. They will vote. <laughs> they will join the workforce where they interact with other people. And, you know, some of them might run for political office. We will have to share the world with them. Hetero kids who didn't learn that it was okay for people to not be like them. And people who are recovering from trauma that could have been avoided if they had known 
about that who they are is normal. I am a bisexual person who grew up in the 80s and 90s when bi erasure was endemic and bisexuality was demonized as something connected always to HIV. I internalized the erasure. I know a lot of others did too. I don't want the next generation to experience that. It's, yeah. <laughs> I also don't want to go into thinking too much about these kids as the adults they will be someday. They also need to be free to be kids. And you know, I wonder, maybe there's like an entire field of study dedicated to understanding what the best way to introduce difficult topics to, to, to minors at different ages are. <laughs> like, like there are education specialists and teachers and child psychologists there are experts here and we should listen to them there are people who know how to design a curriculum and we should listen to the kids because they are the experts in themselves but when, when we listen to pundits talk when we hear people say think of the children we got to ask are they talking about actual kids and what is best for actual kids? Are they interested in listening to the kids? We might remember that these are often the same people who are enacting abortion bills that protect fetuses, but don't want to, but balk at the idea of any support to the mother and to the family when the kid is born. So, and, and that, that is the ultimate of uh, reproductive futurism. They just want the kid to be born. And it's natural to feel protective of the young. It's also natural not to, like, it's fine if you don't. Um, but for you know if we do and i do i feel very protective of, of my nibblings and and i and i love kids in general um and these these people are playing off that impulse but we have so so we have to pay attention when we hear oh, somebody please think of the children we have to go what are they asking us to protect you know it, it, it's a it's a very deep pathos that that hits us so what is our instinct being used to, to, to do? Is it being used to deny kids treatment that is evidence-based, that is, is pro quite potentially the perfect, the right choice that they need um, because of fear that, that maybe, I don't know, like on the one hand, they want us to believe that parents are, know what's best for kids. And on the other hand, they're saying that these parents don't. So <laughs> like we have to we have to think critically about what we are being asked to protect. Because I don't want to protect some ideal image of a child. I, I, I want actual children to have the best chance to grow up into who they want to be <laughs> and, and and also to be constructive useful citizens as much as possible you know uh as as much as according to their abilities <laughs> um you know uh that is is the best thing for us as a society i think for for people to be able to to have the best chance to 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 grow up um and 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 that i think we gotta say we gotta listen to the actual kids we gotta listen to the experts and we gotta let kids learn even when it's difficult and a big part is is letting kids learn that people are different from them and that's okay so yeah when you hear protect the child, when you hear people playing on this protective instinct, think, okay, no, who do we really need to protect? And I say we protect queer kids. I say we protect kids of color. And 
and I'll, you know, I say we listen to kids and I say we protect trans kids. Because these laws, these laws are child abuse. Listening to your kid isn't. Okay, so uh, <laughs> that that's my piece. Um, I hope that it uh, maybe contributes something to to uh, to how you think about these discussions when they come up.